This is what we're here for. We're going to hear from a very wise human being named Garth Spellman. Let me introduce you to Garth. Dr. Garth Spellman is the curator of ornithology at the museum. He grew up in Fargo, North Dakota, developed a passion for biodiversity science through his first summer job as a lab assistant, penny beetle specimens in a paleontology lab at North Dakota State University. Garth went on to receive a BA in biology from Carleton College and an MSc in zoology from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and then a PhD in biological sciences from the University of Nevada. Gosh, Garth, been doing a lot of things. He began his professional scientific career at the Black Hill State University, which I love if you've ever been to South Dakota, and he was initially as a research professor and eventually moving on to become an associate professor. Let's bring Garth to the stage because he's going to talk about invisibility and it's a matter of perspective. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, RJ. Everyone can hear me, I assume. So I don't have a handheld. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much for inviting me today. Uh, this is the first time I have spoken in front of a live audience in two years. So pretty crazy. And it's wonderful to see actual faces and not virtual faces. Um, and to have my screen just looking back at me with my slides, it's nice to see eyes. Um, I'm going to talk about invisible from an ornithological perspective. And we're going to touch on a few things today. The first thing, though, I want to ask is how many fingers am I holding up right now? All right, so hands up for two. Hands up for three. OK, so apparently something's not there for some of you, right? My kids would ab ab absolutely say, I have two. I have two fingers and one thumb, right? But the thumb is, in fact, a finger. But your perspective is what influenced your answer in that case. And so perspective right, is very important when we're talking about how we see the world and what we see. So viewing something from one side, you might think it looks different than if you're on the other side. And this perspective, it biases us. It biases what we see in real life. Right? So in this image, how many birds are there? Can I see hands up for one? OK. Hands up for two. Hands up for three. OK, the last ones are actually correct. There are two little babies down here that you can barely see. OK, so that is an Egyptian night hawk, pretty camouflaged. It doesn't want us to see it. So when we look at nature, oftentimes there's more there than meets the eye immediately. How many birds are in this picture? Hands up for one. Hands up for two, three. The birds aren't real, yeah, that, that whole thing. Mm -hmm. So there is one in this picture, and it's another nighthawk, OK? How many birds are in this picture? OK, it's zero. OK, I was going down, <laughs> right? I was going down. This is just leaf litter. But, right? When we all look at the same thing, we might see different things. And it's our background and other things that influences that. So I'm going to talk about two types of invisibility and being invisible today. So I'm going to talk about the first thing is bias blindness. It's what I've named it. And it's how our backgrounds and our point of view influence how we see the world. And the second one is true invisibility absolutely being invisible. And those are things that are beyond our ability to see. Okay? The natural world is defined by things that are outside of our senses. We cannot perceive everything that's out there, and so we'll talk about that as well. And so the first thing I want to talk about, bias blindness, actually has to do with science and the history of science. So this is Carlos Linnaeus. So the father of modern taxonomy and binomial taxonomy. That's why every species has a genus and a species name, is because of his rules of classification. And it's how we define the world around us. It's how we describe everything. But he was a northern European white man. And therefore, he 
actually was raised with innate and inherent biases in how he saw the world. So he described birds as, you know, a beautiful and cheerful portion of created nature. Why does he say created? Because this was before Darwin. He actually believed in divine creation and not evolution by natural selection. So consisting of animals having a body covered with feathers and down, protracted and naked jaws, two wings formed for flight and two feet. They are aerial, vocal, swift and light and destitute of external ears, lips, teeth, scrotum, womb, bladder, epiglottis, corpus callosum, and an arc and a diaphragm. So I love that description, right? But he was wrong about a lot of things. One thing was his description of a common kingfisher. So which are the birds that are pictured right there? So you have the male presenting female with some food, but he actually described different geographic variants of this bird as being part of different genera. So that means that the first name in that species, that binomial, was different for birds that actually belonged to the same species. Why? Because these specimens were sent to him by collectors who went to other areas of the world, sent the specimens back, and he had no context really for what was in between those areas where the specimens were collected. So he had this white European male perspective. And this carried out through history and through ornithological history. So for the most part, most male and female hummingbirds, when they originally were just described, were described by European men uh, that were part of the aristocracy working on classification of these birds. And so this crimson topaz that you see, oh, I turned it off, that was bad. The crimson topaz that you see here on the left, the male is on, on the far, far right for you and the female is just to, the, just to its left. They were described as separate species originally because the people that collected those birds sent them back to Europe with no context, didn't write down whether one was male or one was female. And so you had a label that just showed where these birds were from and they looked so different from one another that they called them different species. And no one thought to ask anyone who might be from South America, you know, what these birds were and that they were the same. Same with this puff leg down here. It was originally described as two species for the male and the female. So this was invisible to them based on their background. Now, we also have other things in biology that seem to be invisible to us. I have two birds here. That's not their names. <laughs> That's who took the pictures, just so you know. Okay, anytime you see a name on there, that's the name of the person who took the picture. Okay, now I'm gonna play a song for you. Now, which of these birds made that song? The one on your left. Who wants to raise their? The one on the left, who says that? Okay, the one on the right. All right, that's very interesting. So does anyone know what bird this is? This is a, this is a house finch. You have the male on the left and you have the female on the right. Now that I tell you, right, what the sex are, does anyone else, does anyone want to change their answer? So who made this sound? Is it the bird on the left? Okay, or the bird on the right. Okay, so I have lots of people saying bird on the left, bird on the right. Well, we are biased from living in temperate regions, but the truth of the matter is female birds sing. Now, that one that I played for you was in fact the male, but you could hear a female singing, a female house finch. But we need to say this loud and clear because we are biased in our perspective. I learned as a young boy growing up in North Dakota that any time you saw a bird pitched up, perched up high and singing, that it was a male bird when I was a kid. It was reinforced through my upbringing and through my education. 
I remember distinctly taking ornithology and having my professor or ornithologist tell me that the reason birds sing is because their balls are so big. <laughs> now you think about that, right? There's a lot in that statement, right? It means that it's only males, and it also tells you something about reproductive condition. So yes, male birds, testes, do grow, right? Sometimes a hundred time fold during the breeding season when they're in breeding condition. But it actually doesn't make sense when you think about it as being that's why they sing, because the females, their reproductive organs grow sometimes even more than that, a thousandfold. And so that comment is something that sticks with me to this day, but it biased the way I looked at biology and the way I looked at the world. And female song in birds to an ornithologist was invisible based on that one experience that I had. And so this is a female kiwi, lays the largest egg per its body size in the world. And so you can imagine that female should be screaming, <laughs> right? So, now, if I'd have grown up in the tropics, I probably not, would not have viewed the world the same way because the majority of birds in the tropics engage in what is called duetting. The males and the females sing with each other and at the same time. Now, I have to present a little bit of science to you, but we've learned recently as more women have started to study bird song, and this is how bias is being overcome, that in fact, 76% of all songbirds, these are birds that learn song, so they're part of a radiation that is nearly half the birds that we find on the planet, but 76% of those species have female song. And if we look at it, it's also ancestral. So this is an evolutionary tree, and it traces back to the ancestor of all of these birds and predicts whether or not the, whether or not there's going to be a particular trait at that ancestor. And if we go back, we can be almost 97% sure that the original ancestor of all songbirds, both the males and females sang. And this is crucial for our understanding of nature. In fact, one of the most widely studied birds on the planet, barn swallows, it wasn't until last year that two researchers from Colorado published a paper that actually showed that female barn swallows sing, and the males, right, sing as well. Now, this is immensely important for our understanding of nature. We have thought for the longest time that sexual selection explains the evolution of complex signals in birds, and this was invisible to us. If we know that females sing, and they have for a long period of evolutionary history, it means that complex communication in birds did not necessarily evolve via sexual selection. It probably evolved due to social evolution and natural selection, which means communication and complex communication in birds is more like us. And we think of ourselves as being unique and exclusive. We like to think of human exclusivity, but it's probably not all that true. There are other animals on this planet that communicate in complex ways and have evolved in very similar ways to us. That's social evolution. And so if a bird was to study us, you know, would you want them to say, you know, all we're talking about is sex? Right? That might explain a little bit of our communication, but it doesn't explain everything. And so I talked a bit about bias blindness and how that causes us to not see things that might be right before our eyes. But we can use birds to talk about things that are truly invisible as well and things that we can't see. And these are things that are beyond our senses. And so to do that, we need to learn a little bit about bird eyes. Mm -hmm. And so bird eyes are far better than ours. They're far superior. You see these bones that they have in their, that are in the skull right there? Those are actually within their eyeballs. They're these sclerotic rings. And so 
Those are bones within the eyes. And that sclerotic ring allows for increased acuity and also reduces the chances of deformity throughout the life of a bird. So their eyes, right, they won't become misshapen. They don't lose acuity, visual acuity throughout their lives. So we have con we're in contacts right now. Many of you probably have contacts or glasses. And so you lose that ability. They also have a, very, a much higher density of rod cells within their eyes. Rod cells just allow you to see light, not necessarily different wavelengths or color, but they collect that light. So that higher density means that they're able to collect a lot more light. They can see during darkness. They can see at crepuscular times, at dusk and dawn. Um, they also have four types of cone cells. Now that's really important. We only have three. So what does that mean? Well, most birds are able to see a much wider range of color than we can. They have one particular cone cell that is extremely sensitive in the UV spectrum. We are not able to see UV light. And so a bird's view of the world is beyond anything that we could actually comprehend. We cannot see like a bird. We do not know exactly what they see. But we can use special light and special filters to try and get an idea of what their world might look like to them. And so by doing that, we can take a common starling. This is a bird that you would see, so out in city park. Under visual light, this is what a common starling looks like, or European starling looks like. Under UV light, that's what it looks like. And if you combine those images, a, a, a European starling probably glows in the dark to a certain degree, and you can really make out its body. So they look very, very different. But a bird perceives its world, and it can see these colors, most birds. Moving through a forest or looking for, at flowers is a far different experience for a bird than it is for us. So on the left here, you have under our capabilities. And on the right, you see what a bird might see for each of those flowers. It's very, very different. So, and your common daisy probably looks dramatically different to a bird than to us. In many, in many ways, they glow. Birds move their through their environment very quickly, forest birds, for example. And UV vision actually probably plays an important role in moving through that environment. You have human vision on the top and bird vision on the bottom. So the waxy cuticle of fruits and leaves actually reflects UV light in the forest. And so moving through their environment, they can see the edges of branches, the edges of leaves much better than we can. And it allows them to move through that environment much better. So UV light actually reflects off of rotten fruit um, in a different way than it does off a of ripe fruit. So they can detect ripe versus rotten fruit a lot better than we can as well. Have you ever seen a nest of a bird that lays eggs in sand? Oftentimes to us, they look dull and bland. But those eggs actually reflect in the UV spectrum. So a tern that might nest in the sand, and we see that nest as really camouflaged. It's hard to see. To the birds, it jumps right out at them. And they can see their eggs and the spots on them that allow them to determine which nest and which eggs are theirs. So jumps out at them as well. We are unable to see that. And even a bird itself looks very differently to, an, to another bird than it does to us. And we can tell that under UV vision or UV light and UV filters. So a bird that is black and has this iridescent sheen to it, that iridescence reflects in the UV spectrum as well. And so the birds look very different. We are unable to see what a bird truly looks like to another bird. But the truth of the matter is that, you know, not all birds want to be seen. So we have that nighthawk that's camouflaged. And this is where sort of my research sort of comes in. It's in the invisible where the most exciting biodiversity research is being done right now. Because most of the birds that we can see 
and determine using our own vision have already been described as species. But it's those that are cryptic, cryptic species. There's are the organisms that appear very, very similar and we can't tell apart visually. But we're describing new species. We're learning through genetics, sound, and other behaviors that these birds can be separated. These are some forest bulbuls that you find um, in Indonesia. And so I just want to provide one example of what some of the work that I do. I study tree creepers. They're these little birds that you find. Now, they're found in forests throughout the northern hemisphere. They nest underneath sloughing, sloughing bark, so in these forests, and they feed on insects in between bark using their very fine forcep-like bill to pry insects out between the bark. They prefer old growth forests. And throughout the world, there's nine recognized species of these. Two of these, the Eurasian creeper right up here, and the brown creeper, this is the one that you find within North America, those were considered the same species until about 15 years ago. And then they were separated. They don't come in contact. One's entirely in North America, the other's across Eurasia. Um, but they only were recently separated because they look almost identical to one another. And that's because this species is constrained by natural selection. It doesn't want to be seen. If it's seen while it's feeding on the bark, it's really easy to pick off. It's very small has no defenses, and so little um, falcons and little um, hawks really want to eat these guys. And so there's a bird right there, you can barely see it, and that's what they look like when they're feeding. So because natural selection constrains them, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not evolving to be separate species or separate things. And so I study avian genetics to help me tell these birds apart. And so in North America, this is work that I've been doing for several decades, and I know presenting science is always hard, but we've sequenced the genomes of these birds, and we find that down in southern Arizona, there's a very deep genetic break between the northern and the southern creepers. So they actually originate or separated from one another about one million to 700,000 years ago. That is the equivalent of us compared to Homo erectus. So we can think about that amount of evolutionary time and that amount of time. And they're very genetically different. And what's amazing is when you sequence the genomes of these things, you can actually look at what is happening in their chromosomes. And we actually find that there are parts of their genome that have been totally turned around on chromosomes. They're called inversions. And so those chromosomes, those turning around of those chromosomes, don't allow them to mix very well. If they hybridize, which they do, they need to be completely heterozygous for these regions in the genome. They need to have both right types from either parental in order to survive. And as soon as they back cross, they probably perish because they're genetically incompatible with one another. Now, if you held these birds in your hand, you wouldn't be able to see them. It's invisible, those differences. But they're different species. They cannot mix, they can't hybridize. And so what you see, you know, isn't necessarily what you get. So I'll just finish by saying, by, with my take home messages today, and I just want you to realize and you know, talk with someone from a different point of view. Think about that because I guarantee it'll open your eyes and you'll see things in this world that you didn't see before. And that's something that we should, you know, carry with us on a daily basis, especially, you know, nowadays that it, in, in a world that's so polarized, you know, we need to open and our perspective in order to see what's out there. And then the second thing is, it's just, Never assume you're seeing the full picture, and especially in nature. If you're out observing birds or you're out observing insects or anything, understand that you never are seeing exactly what's going on. There's so much more to learn. So with that, thank you very much. Yes.